Week 7, Visual and Atmospheric Storytelling. Welcome to Week 7, where we will explore visual and atmospheric storytelling throughout a scene and in a script. As the script editor Kate Lee says, a script must have a beginning, a middle and an end, but most of all, it must have an end. How many times have we left the cinema carrying in our heads a range of thoughts and emotions that, if it is a good film, stay with us for days afterwards? How many times have we looked forward to the next episode of our favourite television drama or sitcom because we want to become engrossed in the world created for us on screen? We almost forget our own lives. Of course, plot and character play a crucial part in provoking such powerful reactions from the film audiences, but so do does the atmosphere and the visualisation of the drama. This aspect of the creative process is difficult to analyse and pinpoint because sometimes in the creating of a piece of art the work comes into being naturally and instinctively. Even in filmmaking with all the organising and planning it takes to realise instinct and natural ability are in constant use. My old friend David Yates who is directing a total of three Harry Potter films just seems to know how to get great performance out of his actors. Don't ask me how he does it, he just does. But one doesn't use natural ability and instinct arbitrarily or randomly. Creating a visual language and an atmosphere requires careful thought. This week's session comes in two parts. Atmospheric storytelling and visual storytelling. First, let's tackle atmospheric storytelling. We are heading into an area where, it's un where it is sometimes difficult to know when the writer's job ends and the director's job begins. To be clear, it is the responsibility of the writer to suggest the atmosphere and the tone of the script. It is the responsibility of the, d responsibility of the director to realise that atmosphere and tone on the screen. However, and this is a crucial point, it is not the job of the writer to include in his or her script how the film should be shot. It is not appropriate to write in the stage directions close up of Angela's face as she smokes a cigarette. That is the director's and the cinematographer's job. So without describing shot types in our script, how do we create atmosphere? What tools are in our toolbox? What decisions must we make? There are two questions we can ask ourselves when establishing the tone and atmosphere. What kind of film or television drama is this? And what am I trying to say to the world? Sometimes the answer is very simple. I am writing a romantic comedy and my message to the world is love conquers all. Sometimes it is more complex. You might want to write a tragic love story where the characters are in love but are mutually, are, but are mutually destructive because of the type of world they grew up in and the choices they made, such as leaving Las Vegas. But once you are absolutely clear on what type of drama you are writing and what you want to say to the world, you are ready to make decisions on tone and atmosphere and you are in a position to know how you will sequence your scenes. So your romantic comedy, sorry, delete that last bit, Pause. first let us consider scene and sequence construction. We have talked a lot about the content of a scene and how a scene must reach its climax and resolution as economically as possible. But that does not mean that everything is done in a rush. The pace of the scene depends on the feelings of your character. In other words, their inner world, what their objective is in the scene and where the scene is taking place. Often, but not always, the scene setting is in conflict with the character's goal and inner world. For example, they are trying to come to terms with the end of a relationship in a bar full of happy people. The length of the scene depends on how quickly your character does or does not reach their objective. Is it 10 seconds long or 10 minutes? I would like to return to dramatic irony at this point. All drama uses dramatic irony, but genres such as thrillers and horror stories deploy the use of dramatic irony constantly. Dramatic irony is when one character knows something and another doesn't, when the audience knows something that the character doesn't, or the character knows something that the audience doesn't. This is a great technique for creating atmosphere in horrors and thrillers, the will-they-won't-they they thrill of the unresolved storyline that takes us from one progressive problem to the next, 
and the eventual overall resolution of the film that leaves us collapsed and spent in our seats. Classically, in, the, in horrors, the girl goes out in the woods calling out, is anyone there? And we are on the edge of our seats because we know or we are almost certain that the assailant is there. That's a rather cliched and obvious example, but the same principles apply to great films and tra television dramas too. Look at Ridley Scott's s seminal film Alien. The audience know that the alien is hiding and stuck to the ceiling of the endless dark corridors of the ship, but the crew member does not. But Alien is also a great example of the use of surprise. I am old enough to have seen the film when it was first released and I, like millions of others, leapt screaming from my seat when the alien burst out of John Hurt's stomach as the crew sat eating their evening meal. Used surprise judiciously, however, on closer inspection the scene in Alien is not entirely surprise. It is the conclusion of a series of scenes using dramatic irony. We have seen before how one of the aliens attached itself hand-like to John Hurt's face. We have seen how the crew struggled to keep him alive, but with the subject matter of the film working entirely in tandem with the tone and atmosphere of the film, we, the audience, sense that when John Hurt seemed to regain consciousness to the delight and relief of the crew, all was not well. Secondly, let us consider our colour palette. If we are writing a script set on a county estate on the outskirts of Manchester and it is a melancholic story about young men involved in gangs, how would you describe what the setting looks like and what the young men look like? Without going into too much detail, you might decide that your colour palette is grey, blue and black, with a little bit of brick red thrown in. This will help you when you are describing both the setting and what the characters are wearing and the colours of their cars and so on. If you are writing a script set on a council estate on the outskirts of Manchester and it is funny and life-affirming, such as Paul Abbott's Shameless, your colour palette might be entirely different. It could not only include the white and grey of the estate, but also the sparkling street lights outside, star-filled skies and fairy lights and oil lamps inside. It could include bright coloured blouses for the women and flashy trainers for the men. By a simple description of the colours in which you see your story, you will see how quickly and easily it is to create an atmosphere. It is often the case that there is a different atmosphere in different parts of your film, and that a different colour palette could well be appropriate. But if there is an atmosphere that prevails throughout your film, stick to basically the same colours. You might find it useful to look at some paintings whilst considering the colour pa palette of your film. L.S. Lowry, for example, only ever used about half a dozen different colours to evoke the world of industrialised Manchester in all his many, many paintings. You must also think about the principal location and supporting location of the film. Sometimes this is easy because a writer wants to write a particular pl about a particular place and time, such as Lynn Ramsey did in Ratcatcher, urban Scotland during the 1970s Bin Men strike. On other occasions, the writer has thought of an idea in isolation, and so they must think of the right setting that best serves their idea. With decisions such as these, try to think as broadly as possible, and do not just go for the most obvious choice, born out of the world that you know. I recently experienced this writing a film called In His Shoes, about a boy who wants to be a girl and takes a contraceptive pill in the hope of growing breasts. When I first sat down to write it, I came to a scene where the boy was dressed in female clothing and dancing. Inevitably, I kept describing his sparkling dress and how he listened to Shirley Bassey, and I thought to myself, I've seen all this before. In the end, I decided that a British Indian family would best express my story. The femininity of the fabrics and the saris, the music both gentle and powerful, the images of strong men wearing eye makeup appeared to be the best way of telling my story. Inevitably, as a white northerner, I had to do a lot of research. Props, too, play an important part, but again, please do not start detailing every pop in the, mo in the room as you write. It is the art department's job to dress the set, not yours. It is appropriate for the writer to use key props that tell us something about the character. Perhaps your character always nervously clutches her handbag or jingles loose change in their pockets. Perhaps they love to water their plants. 
This reminds me of the wonderful adaptation of John le Carre's book, The Constant Gardener. We learn everything we need to know about the main protagonist by the fact that he wants to garden and not think about the injustices in the world, and yet he works for the Foreign Office. That particular character trait tells us the theme of the story and the journey the main protagonist must take. Let us not forget the use of sound. Remember that great scene in Alfred Hitchcock's North by Northwest? We hear the engines of the crop duster aeroplane before it appears. Just as Cary Grant wonders what on earth is making that noise, so does the audience. Then the crop duster appears and attacks Cary Grant in the cornfield. David Lynch is a wonderful exponent of sound. In his first feature film, Eraserhead, the heating pipes in the apartment block constantly hum and buzz, thus adding to the tension and the claustrophobia that the main protagonist feels. So going back to my example of someone coming to terms with the end of a relationship in a busy bar, perhaps the shrill laughter of a female customer drives our male protagonist crazy. He leaps from his seat and barges his way out of the bar to take out his fury on an unsuspecting passerby. Thus the climax of the scene is achieved through the simple use of sound. Please note, unless music is integral to the film or television drama, it is not the responsibility of the writer to, de to decide what the music is like and where it should feature. And so to recap, to create atmosphere, use scene and sequence construction, a colour palette, choice of location, essential props and essential sounds. For your first exercise, I would like you to watch one or preferably all of the following films. The aforementioned Alien by Ridley Scott, The Servant by Joseph Losey, Happy Go Lucky by Mike Lee. All three of these films are highly atmospheric and I would like you to remember just how cinema literate you are by making a note of your response to all the elements within the film. Part 2. Visual Storytelling The essential law of writing for the big and small screen is to externalise everything, visualise everything. Over the last few weeks we have talked about the three-act structure, the theme, dramatic forms and genre, characters, dialogue, and today we have talked about atmosphere. We have talked about how to construct scenes using minimum dialogue, how to create characters for the screen, and how the atmosphere of film contributes enormously in the telling of our story. Do you remember looking at that extract from The Wild Bunch, and how the story unfolded without verbal explanations? That type of storytelling is only possible on screen. Remember that originally all films were silent. There is a whole heritage that comes before us in the art of telling films stories visually, and now it's down to you. For this week's exercise, I would like you to write a short film script using no dialogue. I expect the film to last about five minutes in length. Think carefully what you want your film to be about and what genre of film it is. Follow the three-act structure. Think about your characters and how to externalise their inner lives. Think about the atmosphere and how it will help you tell your story. To help you on your way, I will give you some themes, but feel free to think of your own if you would prefer. Love will tear us apart. Stand and deliver. The winner takes it all. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. As you will note, these are all song titles from my misspent youth. I've given you these song titles for a reason. I do not want you to spend days trying to think of a theme. This is a demanding assignment, but don't take it so seriously that you cannot get on and write. Treat it as an exercise, no more and no less. To help you on your way, I have posted my script Friday night onto the website. This 10-minute film, commissioned by the UK Film Council and South West Screen, follows perhaps the perhaps small dreams of a bunch of teenagers on a Friday night. It lasts 10 minutes and there is no dialogue. You might also try and look at The Most Beautiful Man in the World, a wonderful short film that again uses no dialogue. Ends.